and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. This webinar is being hosted by the Interdisciplinary Global Development Center, also known as the IGDC. I'm Enrica Altink, and I'm one of the co-directors of the IGDC. The IGDC is an interdisciplinary learning and research community for equitable global development based at the University of York. The IDDC undertakes interdisciplinary research that particularly focuses on social justice, global health, and sustainable environments. We also offer undergraduate and postgraduate academic programs in global development. The center brings together researchers from across the humanities and the social and the natural sciences, not just within the University of York, but also globally. We also encourage our researchers to work with one another, as well as with policymakers and practitioners to address global development challenges. Today's paper very much addresses two of our key themes, social justice and sustainable environments. Before we start the seminar, I want to mention a few brief housekeeping points. First of all, this session is being recorded, but only the video and the audio of the panelists. Your mics will be muted, your video will be off, and you won't be recorded. The only information that may be recorded are any questions that you type in the Q&A um, box, and that may include your name, which could be identifiable based on your Zoom name. If you have any questions that you want the panelists to address, then please click on the Q&A button in the bottom bar. We will select questions from those submitted, and we try to answer as many as we can. You can submit your questions at any time, but we will only have questions and answers in one slot at the end of the seminar. If you notice questions in the Q&A that you particularly like, or that you were just going to ask yourself, then you can upvote function. Um, there is an upvote function that you can use to indicate that. If you are tweeting, you can tweet about this event um, and then use the hashtag at um, hashtag IGDC webinar. If you have any technical issues, then please use the chat function to talk to the IGDC webinar host. So to reiterate any questions, put them in the Q&A box, any technical issues, use the chat. But now I would like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Ariane Collins is a lecturer in the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews. Her work lies at the intersection of climate change governance, environmental policy, and international development. More specifically, she analyzes the interplay between market-based conservation and post-colonial development. Her work features an emphasis on processes of racialization and histories of colonialism and the challenge of these to the successful enactment of forest government's policies in, in the global south. Ariane was awarded a PhD from the Central European University in Budapest. She also holds a master's in research from the University of Westminster and a BA from the University of Guyana. Before she joined the University of St. Andrews, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the um, Institute for Critical Inquiry in Berlin, and she was also a visiting researcher at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. So I'm going to hand over to Ariane. Thank you very much, Enrica, for the introduction, and thank you also to the IGDC for having me. I am really pleased to be here. I see that um, this particular webinar is part of a stellar lineup of speakers, and I am really honored to have been invited. So I will begin this session by telling you a bit about a recently published paper of mine titled Racing Climate Change that was that recently came out in the journal Politics. Um, I will first give you, um, I will share with you a few snapshots from my field sites, Guyana and Suriname. On your screen, you can see an image of what looks like a relatively pretty place with water and trees in the background and apparently um, a tropical environment. But for this site is um, really central for the movement of gold and other resources from the forests of Suriname to the capital of Paramaribo. So in the surrounding areas and further afield, there are a number of gold miners who um, deforest, uh, who cut forests basically to access gold beneath the soil, and they pass through this area to get to Paramaribo. And this area is also interesting for me because it 
represents, it, it is actually land that was submerged in the building of the hydropower dam. I'll tell you a bit more about that later, but uh, this is the image. The next image is actually another picture of another angle of the, the, the reserve, basically, of the reservoir. So in, from, I took this picture while standing in Brownsberg. So Brownsberg is a nature reserve um, in Suriname, and it is also an eco-tourist site. Lots of people travel to Suriname to um, see the amazing flora and fauna. However, from Brownsberg, you can see further afield, um, you can see water. And this is actually land that was also submerged in the construction of the Afobaka Dam. And if you look really carefully, you might be able to see some hints of white on top of the water. This is, th these are the submerged streams. So when the Dutch government built, uh, when they constructed the dam, they did not remove the trees. So the trees remain there as a kind of weird haunting of the area that remind you of the land that was submerged. Um, there is also gold mining taking place in, or at least there was at the point of my data collection, there was gold mining taking place within the nature reserve. And this was really contentious as a number of my respondents had indicated especially because of who was carrying out the gold mining. Generally, it was people um, of maroon ancestry who had been displaced when the Afobaka Dam was constructed. So these communities were displaced to an area called Browns Brownsbeck, where a number of them um, were classed as transmigratory. So the government relocated some of them to uh, facilitate dam building. Those who were not relocated or those who refused to move lost their lives. So these displaced communities have turned to gold mining to sustain themselves. And as in an awareness of this, um, the, the, the people who are uh, tasked with managing gold mining in Suriname are very cautious about just saying that gold mining should not take place in the park. In the next image, you'll see um, a Maroon community member. Uh, so I interviewed him about his thoughts on avoided deforestation initiatives and whether or not he thought it would be helpful to be paid to avoid deforesting practices. But again, I'll come back to this a bit more later. But I sat in, in his home and he told me that even though he was captain of one of the, of one of the Maroon communities, he was also um, a gold miner. And he believed that uh, forests should be protected in the interests of the global good and so on and so forth. But he also recognized that as part of his means of survival, he must cut trees to access the gold with, beneath the soil. Connecting these histories also, the histories of colonialism and the construction of the dam, was this man pictured on the screen, who is the descendant of um, some Maroon community members who were forcibly relocated when the dam was constructed. And in this image, he's showing me the house that you see, um, the one further right. And he's telling me that this was the house that was constructed for them and that his family was supposed to live in. These were the types of houses, but that it was not suitable and was in, it, that these houses were inadequate. And if you look a little further left, you see a more uh, robust looking house. And this is what is more common at the moment in the communities, at least when I was there, um, because they have sought to, in their words, use the resources around them, whether that is gold, soil, trees, in order to try to develop for themselves some more robust accommodation. Um, in the slide that I'm showing you now, you can see just some medium scale gold mining taking place again in this area. This is in uh, Saramaka in Suriname. So not far from the Brownsbeck area, there is gold mining taking place. Also a little further afield heading along the Surinansa River, um, I was on my way to, uh, to visit and to interview a few people in, in, in Maroon communities further along the river. And what you see again is a relatively benign looking image but basically the man who is leading, who is uh, 
driving the boat, so to speak. He's using a stick to try to avoid, um, to try to push the boat along because the boat is moving closer to the rocks. This is because at this time he was indicating that the river had lower water levels and that this has been um, more of a problem for them traversing the river because of the Afobaca Dam. So they are still even further afield from the actual Browns Bay, Browns Bay area. They're still dealing with um, some of the unwanted side effects of the construction of the dam, not just physically, but also historically, as I tease out in my work here and, other, and elsewhere. And a little even further afield, um, I also visited um, Apura in Suriname. And this is on the west of Suriname, closer to the Guyana border. And in the image, the, so you can see an indigenous woman with whom I spoke. And she took, her, took the time to tell me about some of the struggles that they were facing with logging that was increasingly taking place in their communities. and. Um, some of the struggles they are also facing regarding technological like machines that the loggers are using that they see as a threat to their ways of life and more um, directly if you can if you look on the right side of the image you see a small plant she had shown me that this plant to tell me that usually it would be much larger but it's much smaller um, because of climate change so she explained the different ways in which their lives were being changed as a result of climate change. Um, they were not able to farm during the same time period that they usually are because the sun is hotter. And she detailed uh, other struggles that these communities, well, that this particular indigenous community was facing in dealing with some of the changes of climate change. So in Suriname, generally, the majority of the population uh, that resides in the forest is, can be categorized as maroon or indigenous. But once again, we'll come to that. But just to then uh, abstract or step back a bit from the detail that I just shared with you, I'll tell you a little bit about the cases um, that, well, Guyana and Suriname, the two countries that I studied. So Guyana in, has a population of roughly 750,000 people. 90% of these people reside on the coast. And in the remainder of uh, the territory, there is a spread of predominantly Amerindian or indigenous communities. This, isn't a hundred, this is not absolutely the case. There are other um, groups like Afro-descended communities around uh, bauxite mining and smaller areas. But generally, uh, you can, we can say that the forested areas of Guyana uh, are populated by um, Amerindian communities. Suriname has a population of 530,000 people, roughly, 87% of whom reside on the coast, and 13% uh, is spread throughout the rest of the territory, and it's predominantly maroon and indigenous communities, as I had previously mentioned. Both countries are especially vulnerable to climate change, and uh, this manifests itself quite often with um, really devastating floods. So Guyana, Suriname and French Guyana, as you, you can see them on, on the map on the left side of the image, they are the only non-Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries in South America, which in itself tells you quite a bit about the colonial shaping of the, of, of the South American continent. Um, Guyana gained its independence from the British in 1966 and Suriname from the Dutch in 1975. French Guyana is, not, is still not independent. It is considered to be an overseas department of France. Um, a little further on the right of the image, you see a bigger, um, a bigger picture, a bigger map of the South American continent. And in general, my work focuses on uh, the northern aspect part of the map. So the Guyana Shield, you can't see it too clearly in this image, but in studying the Guyana Shield, um, I tend to focus on those countries that are independent within the shield, and those are Guyana and Suriname. A big part of the shield is also made up, um, it's also formed by Brazil, and but all these countries are covered by Amazon forests. And this is, I think, what I'd like to highlight about their situation, physical, geographical situation. Um, both these countries 
have suffered over 400 years of colonialism. And they have been roughly independent for, we can say 50 years, it's actually closer to 55 and 45, but roughly across the two, about 50 years of independence. Guyana and Suriname were shaped almost entirely through their colonial histories. And I say this um, in recognition of the fact that these countries, the indigenous people who had populated these countries, were they encountered in uh, European explorers in the late, um, in, in, at the end, the close of, I think, 1492 or thereabouts. But generally, the population um, of these two countries was shaped almost entirely through the subsequent colonial encounter. Um, this remains evident through their colonial histories, state formation in the fact that they gained independence from the British and the Dutch, for example, and their, their economic circumstances. They are both still in possession of some highly valuable conservation areas since they're covered with, by Amazon rainforests. And there has been some research recently that indicated that deforestation, in particular sites of the Guyana Shield, of which, as I noted, Guyana and Suriname are a part, they have, it, it has the potential to severely or disproportionate, disproportionately affect the hydrological function of the wider Amazon basin. So what happens in these countries doesn't just stay in these countries. Um, so both these countries are multi-ethnic societies with different groups of people having been brought to these countries to relate to the natural environment in particular ways. This was because their colonial masters were interested in exploiting the natural resources of the areas and they needed labor. So at different periods, different groups of people were brought to, again, labor in these countries in ways that were suitable to the colonial imperatives of the day. And the different ways in which these people related to, the, to nature in these places continues to be evident to shape their economies and to shape the different ways, as I assert, um, and you'll see later in the paper, um, to inform the ways in which these different groups of people navigate climate change. So generally, my research focus, focuses on the reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation initiatives. Um, Red Plus is an avoided deforestation initiative that is global, and it essentially attempts to pay countries, people, places, actors in general, who still have significant forest cover not to cut their forests down. So it was supposed to complement the clean development mechanism, which at that time was only providing incentives for afforestation and Red Plus, the intention was to try to incentivize the avoidance of deforestation so that countries didn't feel like they needed to cut their forests down and then regrow them to benefit from carbon markets. Um, so I was interested in 2014, um, on, I was interested in the extent to which Red Plus could effectively incentivize the avoidance of deforesting behavior. And given that gold mining is the main driver of deforestation in both these countries, I sought to understand whether gold miners would, could see themselves as avoiding deforestation through, the, through these initiatives and how they position themselves in these discourses of avoided deforestation, climate change, and so on and so forth. So now I'll turn to the paper and tell you um, how my thoughts have um, evolved about these things. So Guyanese historian, academic, and activist Walter Rodney commenced his book, A History of the Guyanese Working People, with an account of the massive effort through which the narrow coastland of Guyana, on which the, mass, the vast majority of its population now resides, was reclaimed from the sea. He wrote that an enduring Dutch and European contribution to the technology of Guyanese coastal agriculture was undeniable. Yet, one must guard against the mystification that it was the Europeans who built the dams and dug the canals. Instead, it was enslaved people from Africa and indentured servants from India 
who had to face up to the steady work diet of mud and water in the maintenance of dams and the cleaning of trenches. A reading of Rodney's account might support bipartite, exclusively social interpretations of how the white colonizer played a central role in the historical construction of race by bringing different groups of people, of different groups of differentially exploited people to the then colony to labor in support of capitalist development. However, his, his account can also be read differently as a tense indicative, um, as indicative, sorry, of a tense and tumultuous tripartite relationship between first, the environment in the form of mud and water, second, white Europeans, and third, black and brown workers, brown workers from Africa and India, through whose collective actions, the climate vulnerable coastland emerged and came to prominence. These European directed Asian and African executed battles against the environment informed not only the racialized subjectivities and identities of different groups of people in relation to each other, but also their racialized relationships with the environment. Hence, Rodney's account highlights how what can now be described as a natural environment, as discursively powerful and neutral whiteness, and as base, impure, and exploitable blackness were all abstracted and co-constituted in small part through the creation of the climate vulnerable coastland. Gayan and Suriname have much in common, including multiracial populations established through colonialism, a shared landmass, overlapping Dutch and British colonial histories, and densely populated coasts that lie below the level of the sea, generally. They are also highly vulnerable to climate change, both the physical and governance related aspects of which tend to overlap with colonially rooted, labor inflected, racial population distribution patterns. These vulnerabilities, these overlapping vulnerabilities have been somewhat captured in the social vulnerability literature on natural disasters and hazards, which examines how individual social markers such as race, health, employment status, and income influence or shape the susceptibility of various groups to harm and that, and that also govern their ability to respond. The social vulnerability literature, however, sees race in ways that are static, atemporal, and given. Elsewhere, within critical debates on the Anthropocene, the overlap between the physical effects and governance of climate change on one hand and racial pop population distribution patterns on the other has been dealt with more flexibly as scholars debated which uh, they debated on issues related to which group of people logic or set of events should be given primacy in tracing the emergence of the global capitalist structures and systems that have produced and wreaked havoc on the environment over time. Within these debates, however, consideration of how vulnerability to both the physical and governance related aspects of climate change overlaps with multiple social and historical constructions of race is often globally scaled and color coded with non-white pop populations recognized as being at, at greater risk of experiencing the adverse effects of climate change than their white counterparts. While there is significant value in this observation, the arguments I develop in this paper point to its limitations. I argue instead that in Guyana and Suriname's post-colonial period, during which climate change impacts are increasingly being felt, the immediate relationship to colonizing whiteness no longer plays the central defining role in local constructions of race. Instead, relations with the environment take these constructions forward in ways that undergird the racialized impacts of climate change and efforts to govern it. I'll give you a few examples as I proceed. However, for now, I'd like to note that even further, I argue that the environment has always played a key under-acknowledged role in processes of racialization. 
in ways that complicate color-coded interpretations of race, whether global or local. In this way, my argument decenters or delinks whiteness from its position as automatic oppositional counterpart to non-whiteness in what I refer to as bipartite constructions of race. So whiteness does not disappear. It's just no longer as central um, to analyses of race in these places and the ways in which race informs um, uh, efforts to address or navigate the challenges associated with climate change. In developing this argument, I draw on the work of Anibel Quijano and Patrick Wolf. Wolf reminds us that though race is socially constructed, it is more importantly a site-specific trace of history through which colonized populations continue to be racialized in specific ways that mark out and reproduce the unequal relationships through which Europeans have co-opted these populations. The interests of different oppressed groups often run counter to each other, given that they were exploited and integrated into the colonial enterprise in different ways. In Guyana and Suriname, these traces manifest themselves in racial hierarchies that often align with those of plantation economies. Though these circumstances um, that shifted, have shifted somewhat in the post-colonial period after the white colonizer relinquished direct political power and largely withdrew physically from the geographic space or became localized. The significance of this withdrawal for the ability of subsequent independent governments to chart their own, own paths is surely open to debate. However, I explore not only the effects of this withdrawal on ongoing or continued processes of racialization, but also argue for a rereading of more firmly entrenched bipartite interpretations of race altogether and for greater recognition of the role played by the environment, both locally and globally. So why is this significant? I assert that this represents a shift away from exclusively social interpretations of race to tripartite social and environmental interpretations rooted in colonial histories and the unfolding present. This shift makes space for racialized environments to be further understood as relational, having produced and been produced by social interactions. Most importantly, it makes space for recognizing how climate change maps directly onto flexible, temporal, socially constructed, and racialized environments. Take, for example, these spatial and governance related vulnerabilities to climate change. Red Plus in both countries, in its effort to mitigate climate change by financially incentivizing avoided deforestation, was challenged by race understood in this way. In its focus on forests, Red Plus turned collective international and national attention towards the behavior and practices of indigenous communities who were targeted by an onslaught of consultations, promises of increased wealth, and forest use practices, practice in visibility enhancing activities. At the same time, Red Plus called into question the economic earners of large numbers of Guyanese and Surinamese of African descent, both Creole being those groups of um, formerly enslaved Africans and their descendants who remained on the coast and were eventually emancipated, and Maroons, those groups that uh, were able to escape slavery and sought refuge in the Surinamese forests. But Red Plus called into question the economic earners of these um, descendants of, of, of Africans in Suriname who overwhelmingly rely on deforesting gold mining for an income. Resonances are also likely in discussions on ethanol production. As climate change increasingly makes itself felt, the international market is interested, increasingly interested in ethanol, seen as a more environmentally friendly fuel. Ethanol production, however, is likely to disproportionately affect the large numbers of descendants of indentured servants still working on sugar plantations, especially in Guyana, 
though it has the potential to regenerate an industry that was seen just a few years ago as increasingly economically unfeasible, that being the sugar industry. In other words, according to the climate change mitigation strategy adopted, different racial groupings will be adversely affected. Hence, these governance related aspects of climate change have the ability to ameliorate and or exacerbate the experience of different racial groupings to physical vulnerabilities of the phenomenon. Furthermore, tripartite interpretations of race allow us to see that even those persons who could be globally color coded as black are affected by climate change differently. This is demonstrated in how Creoles on the coast and Maroons in the forest, both of whom are Afro descendants in Suriname, are affected by climate change in different physical and governance related ways. Creoles on the low lying coast are more vulnerable to flooding roughly, while Maroons are more likely directly affected by climate change mitigating forest conservation programs that may affect their ways of life. Furthermore, as the effects of climate change become more strongly felt, the likelihood exists that people on the coasts may be forced to move further inland, exacerbating already present tensions around Amerindian or indigenous claims for greater land rights that we see especially in Guyana which are themselves race-based claims to the natural environment based on specific histories that often conflict with African descendant demands for land, for gold mining in both countries. Thank you. I look forward to your thoughts and questions. Uh, thank you, um, Ariane. Um, I noticed that so far people um, have not yet uh, typed any questions in Q&A, but hopefully it will come. Uh, this was a very rich paper and, um, you know, especially comparing or, or taking together two countries that are both multi ethnic, as you say, with a long history of colonialism that has then uh, put in motion a, a, a hierarchized a notion of, of race. And then looking at how that plays out with this particular initiative, Red Plus, and I was I was particularly interested um, um, in your first couple of slides, which were about the dam, and I just wanted to maybe ask a bit about that, and especially because you were saying that the Maroons, um, because of the building of the dam, have you know started to go into gold mining. So I wanted to get a bit of a sense of when when was the dam built, but also are we talking here about small scale gold mining? And you mentioned again in, in Guyana, it's also gold mining that has become the main driving force of deforestation. So what kind of mining are we talking about? Is this small scale or are there perhaps big companies behind it that then use um, you know, individual um, people to do bits and pieces for them in terms of the gold mining? Um, and, you know, I was really interested that you asked these people whether they, you know, what they thought about, you know, their relation to forest conservation. If you could say a bit about, you know, what, what your findings were around that. Um, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, so the dam was built, I think, in the 50s or 60s in Suriname. And uh, generally, it, as I mentioned in the talk, it really necessitated that these groups of people be displaced or moved to um, Brownsville. And they are, they're like, this group of people is directly referenced whenever it comes to gold mine, management of gold mining in Suriname. So especially in the Surinamese context, um, in the not so recent future, there was very little regulatory oversight of gold mining. And as a result, small scale gold mining took off. And there are lots of informal collaborations between maroon communities and um, the increasing Brazilian presence in gold mining in the space and so on. But uh, it was in talking to one of the uh, pretty, well, one of the persons responsible for trying to instill some order around gold mining in Suriname that these communities were explicitly problematized, well, not problematized, but pointing out at, pointed out as having had these troubled histories that have led to their displacement and have to be considered when we are talking about avoiding deforestation in these ways. 
Um, these communities, however, I, I find it interesting that you also mentioned big companies. So there are uh, multinationals who are engaged in gold mining in both countries. In Suriname, these communities often find themselves displaced by land that is then um, allocated to multinationals for gold mining. So they are also, they are already um, disadvantaged by the colonial histories and the dam construction. And then they're doubly disadvantaged by the disadvantage in terms of mining. I don't want to seem like I am pro mining, but anyway. Um, uh, they're also disadvantaged by the large scale mining concessions. One community that had been displaced, if I remember, I might be saying the name incorrectly, Coffee Camp. Um, they were displaced by the dam construction and then woke up in their transmigratory state and saw that they were being displaced by um, the security guards from the large scale mining companies also. So there are layers of disadvantagedness to the, um, that these communities have to navigate. Uh, in Guyana, it's more, it's, there was a, a more explicit colonial connection that I found between gold mining and um, the historical circumstances of formerly enslaved Africans. So when uh, the Africans were emancipated in Guyana, they were, they, were in, they were really interested in being paid for their work, for their labor, justifiably, I'm sure you might agree. But instead, the British decided to bring indentured servants from India to take over their role on the plantation. And the enslaved Africans in Guyana, formerly enslaved Africans at that point, uh, they were, there were no limits on their mobility within the country. And as a result, they started going into small scale gold mining because the indentured servants didn't have that ability. They, were, they had to remain uh, physically present on the plantations. So in these ways, these colonial histories, I mean, you can't draw very direct connections between colonialism and people mining for, uh, for gold at the moment, but they have in some very clear ways structured the possibilities and options in such a way that the most feasible option is to mine. And then as narratives change and deforestation becomes problematized. This is another layer of um, yeah, exploitation, I guess I could say, that these communities have to face. Um, you also asked how people navigate, how, how they feel about forest conservation. What I'd say is that what I found interesting, especially in the Surinamese case, is that the indigenous communities appeared to be, appeared to be more I should say this differently. They appear to be less interested in mining for gold than the maroon communities. Uh, so they all espouse a need to, to, to um, conserve forests and they're all interested in the well-being of nature and the globe and so on. But what, they, what the different communities in different ways indicated to me was that um, they didn't want to be disadvantaged, further disadvantaged in trying to address the global challenges. Um, yeah, so it was complex but difficult as they expressed it to me. Okay, so we have a couple of questions in the, in the Q&A. And one of them is a question by Irene. And she asked if, is, you know, when it comes to these issues like how people are affected by climate change and so on, is location not more important than race? Is that not more what's really at stake with just where people live, whether they're going to be affected by it rather than what race they are. And I think you already tried to tell us that it's far more complex than that, because, you know, the histories of colonialism already indicate who lives where. Precisely. Thank you for answering the question for me, Enrique. <laughs> <laughs> but this is basically it. Um, location is very important, uh, but people are located in particular ways, in, in particular places, because of the, their race and because of the way that race underpins and undergirds um, the ways in which people were brought to particular places. And this is why I try as, as much as possible to orient my argument to multi-ethnic societies and the post-colonial context because in places where there isn't such a diversity of racial or ethnic experiences and that have not had 
as top down an intervention that situates people in particular places, it would, I think, maybe an argument could be more convincingly made that location is what matters primarily. But um, this unfortunately would be blind to colonial histories that have positioned people in certain ways. And that's precisely my point, that this positioning continues to inform uh, not only vulnerability to the physical aspects, but also to the governance related aspects. So I look at Red Plus as a governance, a forest conservation initiative that aims at um, governing forests. And then there's ethanol as another possible climate mitigation tool. And how do these governance related aspects map onto these societies is really interesting for me. Hence, race is a factor, if not the only one. Um, so we have another question. Does the current political situation in these countries affect the distribution of ASM? I, I consider that, you know, I guess that's artisanal small scale gold mining concession rights. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, indeed, you know, these countries, because they're multi ethnic, they have very complex um, systems of government, like Guyana only had like, uh, you know, very contentious election earlier. So is that related to it? Yeah, definitely related to it. I just tend not to look at the most uh, recent or ongoing manifestations of the contestations around different groups politically somehow, but uh, that's undeniably a factor, especially given that uh, politics in both these countries, of course, as I can't remember her name, Sarah, was it? Um, indicated is very uh, fraught eth like with ethnic tensions, more so in Guyana than in Suriname. In Suriname, there seems to have been more of a, a focus on carving out a national identity that is shared for different groups of people, rather than having politics that is um, a political system like that of Guyana that is fragmented according to two very big groups and therefore very contentious. And of course, gold mining plays a, a, a very significant role in mining concessions, um, especially because different groups of politicians in Guyana, without naming them, forgive me for not wanting to go in this direction, but different groups of populations, um, different groups of politicians drawn different ethnic groupings and different ethnic groupings then have a history of relating to nature in particular ways. So my arguments also inform this recognition because um, groups that might be more supported, uh, po polit political parties that are more supported by Indo-Guyanese, for example, um, would be more interested in finding ways to keep sugar alive because that is where more of their supporters mm -hmm. um, come from and therefore might be more open to ethanol being a climate change mitigation tool. And then they might, might be more open to supplanting or pushing the problem on gold mining where there's more of an Afro-Guyanese base. So these considerations also inform the modern political architecture, though perhaps based on um, due to emotional relationships, um, re responses, I try to avoid dwelling on this too much in my work. And then we have a question from Cynthia, mm -hmm. um, who asks whether development of this tripartite relationship, whether that's only an observed effect of the existing structures, the racial structures, stroke class structures, but did you also find that relationship in the way your interview partner self identified? I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. You're saying, is Cynthia allowed to speak to me directly? Uh, I don't think that's a possibility. It's uh, no, but it's it's in the Q&A. So if you click on it, you might be able to read. Maybe that's slightly easy. It's probably more you know, obviously the way you map it is yeah. by being embedded in the history and knowing the history and, and the current situation, but whether mm -hmm. the interview partners themselves see perhaps some of these, um, mm -hmm. the relationship between, between environment and race as well. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I, I, I know that the, my respondents across the spectrum of ethnic groupings, racial groupings in Guyana and Suriname, they 
all express concern for the forest and about climate change and so on and so forth. Um, but generally, when I when I wrote this paper, it was more of a provocation to um, the way that scholarship, academic scholarship around climate change talks about race uh, without what I see as adequate nuance in recognizing that people within color codes, black, white, brown, et cetera, in particular places have different relations with the environment that are not fully represented when we rely on a code it was more of a provocation in that direction rather than representing, trying to represent fully the different ways in which people identified on the ground. Um, generally, perhaps because I entered this discussion talking about red plus and different people had started to, um, they were already identified by the governments as stakeholders of red plus in particular ways. There was already a, formation of these groupings. So maroon communities who work together on this, indigenous communities who work together on that in both countries. So there was already a self-identification um, racially in how I entered the discussion. So I didn't interrogate this too much, though I tried to take care to not represent people in ways that they didn't themselves identify as far as possible. But my argument is more oriented towards the academic community and its exploration of these issues rather than internal to the country. Yeah, because I, I was wondering as well whether um, you've tried to engage policymakers and, and you know, both countries are, are members of CARICOM, um, whether you know, policymakers are open to the idea that whether a forest conservation method like Red Plus may work is dependent or, or is engaging with these long histories of racialization. Do you think that they are open for thinking in that way? Or are they you know, um, we need value for money, we need very, you know, quick results and we forget about the history? Uh, yeah, generally, I think I am more concerned about the history than a number of the policymakers that I've spoken to. Um, around the discussions, uh, so I spoke to quite a few. In order to try to make sure that I, my work was representative of all the stakeholders, I spoke to people from CARICOM, people who were um, working on, who, who were representative of the logging industries, the gold miners, and so on and so forth. Um, and are they open? They are, they were all interested in Red Plus, but, and they saw it as a potential for both countries to gain income and revenue that is much needed for development, um, developmental outcomes. What was very different was more um, what sacrifices, as I'm sure you would expect, people were willing to make to actually be able to access this pot of money. And there's also the question, of course, of whether Red Plus was actually ever established enough to displace the drivers of deforestation. And all of that is another different, it is a different conversation that I'm having elsewhere. But by and large, I'd say that yes, policymakers were, are very open to it, but some saw it as just another pot of money to be had without changing anything. And some recognize the differential ways in which its effects would be manifested and contested that, especially gold miners. I think we've got time for like one more question. And there was a question uh, about whether schools in Guyana and also Suriname, whether they, you know, do they teach around climate change and forest conservation? Uh, and, and if they do, is, is race, you know, also an, an issue there? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not well placed to answer that question. Um, I know that the universities do. The schools, I'm not so sure. Okay. So I think we probably uh, need to leave it here. But what we've been given by Ariane is a really fascinating overview how climate change attempts to address that climate change intersects with these really long histories of colonialism, of racialization. And as you say, multi-ethnic countries like Guyana and Suriname particularly, you know, exemplify that. I really want to um, take also time to alert um, the viewers to um, a lecture that we have next week, which is our annual lecture. It's called Decentering Migration Research. 
and it's about challenging of walking the talk. And this is very much um, in, in line of some recent um, changes in, in, in funding for development research that have been going on this year. And the talk will be given by Professor Heaven Crawley. It's the same time, two till three, next Wednesday. Um, you can um, uh, go on our website where you can sign on for this event. Um, and also to let you know as well that this event, we're recording it and it will be soon available on our YouTube channel as well. And you will be getting a notification of that. There will also be lots of other events um, throughout the rest of this calendar year and also next year as well. So please keep an eye out for us. Join us on our social media channels, so YouTube channel, our Twitter feed, and you'll be um, notified of any new events that we put on. But thanks again, Ariane, for uh, a fascinating Black History Month talk. And um, I have already read the paper, but lots of people have already mentioned in the chat and in the Q&A as well that they really want to read your paper because it's a really fascinating paper that shows us that you know when we are talking about climate change we also have to talk about these long-standing histories which is often something that's forgotten by a lot of uh, scholars so thank you so much for your work thank you for having me bye bye